Earlier today, Ontario Liberal Premier Kathleen Wynne and Glenn Murray, the Environment Minister of Ontario, took to the podium to announce that Ontario will be implementing a cap and trade program. Now, impressed on what this policy would look like, what it would cost for consumers, they were evasive and deflected by saying that they were just in the design phase. So I've asked Dr. Ross McKittrick, a professor of economics at the University of Guelph, to join me to shed some light on this policy that the Liberals seemed unwilling or uncomfortable to answer questions to. Dr. McKittrick, thank you for joining me. My pleasure. So let me start by asking, let's just start with some first principles here. The cost of energy. If a cap and trade program were to be implemented, the cost of energy would not go up, or sorry, would not go down. Yes. It would not stay the same. It would go up. Is that right? Yes, it would go up. It would have to go up. What would a cap and trade system really look like in Ontario? Well, a cap and trade is a lot like the milk marketing board. It, it means the government sets a certain number of quotas that uh, people can have access to. You have to, in the case of the milk system, you have to own quota to produce and sell milk. In the case of the cap and trade system that they're thinking about, it would be like a quota system for energy. And so in order to use fossil energy or to um, produce and sell fossil energy, you'd have to have a quota. Uh, if you have to buy it at an auction from the government, then it acts just like a tax. More likely, they'll end up giving the quotas away to large uh, firms and then uh, they'll be the beneficiaries of it because uh, they'll be the ones owning what turn out to be very valuable quota certificates but they right. can trade them with each other. Why is that Either more way, likely? All... Why is that more likely if I may ask? Oh because um, uh, they don't like to implement a system where it's obvious how much it's going to cost. Mm -hmm. If you give away the quota certificates then the industries involved are happy because they're basically now set up as a cartel. They can charge higher prices for their outputs and they get these valuable assets. Just like the, the dairy farms that get, in the early days they got free quota and then all of a sudden they're owning quota that are worth millions of dollars. Uh, in this case, if you look at the background documents, for instance, that the Premier announced that, it has absolutely no information about how this is going to work. We're all still in the dark. But it does have a lot of quotes from business groups and industry leaders who are clearly quite pleased with this plan and I think it's because they know that it's being set up as a cap and trade system which really is just another name for a cartel system or right. a, a marketing board type system. It's going to mean they can restrict supply and, and raise prices for consumers coming on top of all the other policies that the province has implemented that have raised energy prices I think it's just going to accelerate that process. They want to deter carbon use. Will this system in any way serve to deter carbon use in your opinion and what does the price of carbon need to be in order to accomplish that would you say? Um, well first of all we've regulated most forms of carbon pollution in the province of Ontario for decades. So carbon monoxide and carbon particulates they've been controlled and have brought, been brought down uh, by a large amount and, and those numbers are already capped so there's nothing new about that and this policy won't have any effect on those regulations one way or the other. Mm -hmm. They're being very deceptive when they keep talking about pollution because we have extensive pollution regulation already in the province of Ontario. The only thing new here would be adding controls on carbon dioxide. And um, there is uh, an argument to be made in economics that if you use a tradable permit system like the one they're thinking about, you can get some efficient pollution reductions. You can get pollution reductions at a lower cost than through regulation. But that only works if you use a cap and trade system instead of all the regulatory mechanisms. It doesn't work if you do what the Liberals, what the current government has done, which is bring in a whole bunch of regulations like promoting wind energy and shutting down the coal fired power plants and, and biofuels mandates at the federal level and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. and then put cap and trade on top of it. You, you'll have very little effect on pollution levels, but you will just add to the costs of the system overall. This. Uh, a cap-and-trade system might have made sense back in the early part of the last decade before they brought the Green Energy Act in. But now that they have the Green Energy Act in place, this is just adding a whole new layer of regulatory costs on top of what they've already done. And not to mention the fact that uh, this will lead to skyrocketing electricity prices and we've seen what it's done to our manufacturing industry. Now, when pressed on what this would cost for consumers, they were evasive and they deflected. Why do you think that is? Well. This unfortunately is the pattern for this government. They didn't ever do a cost-benefit analysis for the Green Energy Act in the first place. 
uh, the Auditor General was, was quite hard on them over this because this has been an extremely costly experiment for the province to uh, switch away from conventional power sources over to wind and solar and they had no idea how much it was going to cost. They made a lot of false statements about this would create jobs and it wouldn't add to our electricity bills. Well, they were wrong on both counts. This time they're not even bothering trying to make any promises about uh, what it's going to do. There's some vague statements about it will expand the, the green technology sector that really just amounts to saying there will be some corporate beneficiaries of this policy but as far as the hit for small businesses and households again we're in the dark because there are no details there's no cost benefit analysis it's uh, um, it's just being rushed out as an announcement I guess because they want to try to look good. You know we've been talking about global warming for some 20 years now <clears throat> and I know that you've been following it to what extent do have the models that have been put forward with respect to global warming turned out to be true? Uh, the, the models that are used, they're called general circulation models and um, they have drastically over predicted the amount of warming that we were supposed to have over the past 20 years. They, uh, they all show a very steady increase in projected temperatures in response to greenhouse gas emissions but the data that we have at the global level and, and certainly uh, in the case of the region that we live in, southern Ontario, shows almost no change and over the past 15 to 20 years uh, there's no trend in the data. Uh, this contradicts the models and uh, a lot of experts in the field are looking at this growing discrepancy and realizing that what it indicates is there's likely a flaw with the models and, and there's a lot of work being done trying to figure out what it is. But what it comes down to is that the policies that were used, or the, the models that were used to guide policy over the past five to ten years are now turning out to give unrealistic uh, information about the effects of greenhouse gases right. on the climate system. I guess, I guess what I'm wondering here is, I guess why I'm wondering here is, based on what you've just said, why are we still listening to these guys then? Well, what we should do is give them another couple of years because if the gap between models and observations doesn't close up in the next couple of years. They will know there's something fundamentally wrong with the models and they'll have to rethink them. This is the worst possible time to use those models to commit to an extremely expensive policy plan. Uh, we're, we're really within a couple of years of knowing whether there's going to be a fundamental rethink of this issue. And there's nothing to be gained by rushing into a policy like the cap and trade system now. It would make much more sense just to wait until the science is complete on this. Okay. Dr. Ross McKittrick, thank you very much for joining me. You're welcome.